Good afternoon, Facebook friends and YouTube followers. This is Rich again, back for your second video blog of the day for October 6, 2014, around 5.42 p.m. on this Monday afternoon. A nice day in Belarac, Massachusetts. The sun's out. Highs in the 60s. It was a cool morning. And we're going to have another nice day tomorrow. Some news to report. It's official. The NBA has signed a deal with Turner Sports and ESPN ABC to extend broadcasting rights to the NBA for nine years beginning with the 2016-2017 season. The deal is worth $2.4 billion. Amazing deal. And I, this was no doubt about it. The NBA has good TV partners with ESPN ABC and Turner Sports. I can never see the ESPN... Um, and the NBA leaving ESPN, ABC, and TNT anytime sh soon. It's it's a good partnership, and it's going to continue well into the next decade. And also one little tidbit, happy German-American Day. And that's a good day, especially for Heidi Klum's. And that's about it on that. And my next subject is about a movie, documentary movie, that came out in 1999 called Beyond the Mat. Beyond the Mat was a documentary about the world of professional wrestling. It was produced by Barry Blah St uh, Steen, Barry Bloom, Brian Grafsquid, Ron Howard, and Michael Rosenboom. It was written and produced by Barry Blah Steen. And it was distributed by Universal Pictures. And it was a film about about is about pro wrestling, and and Barry Boomstein, uh, director of the movie, was a closet wrestling fan. He didn't tell too many people he watched professional wrestling, and he got a crazy idea about filming what it was like for professional wrestling. And the movie took three to five years to produce, and he it was mainly about the to topics was his love of professional wrestling and stuff. The focus of the movie was about three individuals, Terry Funk, Mick Foley, and Jake the Snake Roberts. And also some focus on the movie is about ECW, Darren Drozdorf, Tony Jones, and Mike Modest. And the budget of the movie was $500,000. It made two million dollars at the box office, which they made pretty decent for a documentary movie. And this is the thing about the movie. The movie starts off with Barry watching wrestling, saying he don't tell too many people about it. And then he just showed what the crazy stuff. It was back to his childhood. He saw pro wrestling matches. He, his father and mother brought him to the pro wrestling matches. And afterwards, when they were leaving, leaving he saw the bad guy who was wrestling go go into a car with his wife. It was pouring rain. He just said to himself, this, this guy has a family. And then the movie starts off with um, him going to the WWE. He starts saying it had to start at the top. He visited Titan Tower, the headquarters of WWE in Stanford, Connecticut. And when he was there, they were starting a push for Draws, also known as Darren Drozdorf. And then they had Vince McMahon, Jim Ross, and Shane McMahon in Vince's office along with Darren Draws. And Vince McMahon called called him da Darren Drozdorf puke. And he was says, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna puke, he's gonna puke, he's gonna puke, he's gonna puke. <laughs> that was Vince McMahon's laugh. And then Darren drives off, calls his mother up and says, you wouldn't believe this, I'm now puke. And that was good. And later on, the next segment, uh, it was about um, Barry going to a, a low-level professional wrestling organization called All Pro Wrestling in California, and it was run by an accountant, Roland Alexander, who was a very heavyset man, and he was showing showing new student, new people who wanted to come in to become a professional wrestling, and he says he he, he said to this, you might not like 
what I'm gonna hear, but when if you wanna make the independent scene, you're gonna make like maybe good twenty five, fifty, two hundred, three hundred dollars. But the real big money is at WWE, WCW, ECW. Not to say that we have a good product, but you can't tell our fans about that. And then they showed about the gym wars they had in a kind of warehouse, and they had like one of the matches Barry was filming for the documentary. They had a record crowd of 125 people, and they had they focused it on two two of Roland Alexander's prize students, Tony Jones and Mike Modest, and they were so good. And then Barry show brings a like a like a videotape to Jim Ross, who was at the time the the senior vice president of talent relations, and he's and Jim Ross looked at it and he says he he liked the tape. He was going to give Mike Modest and Tony Jones a tryout, and they and they got a tryout with the WWE just before a a raw match, a dark match, and I think it was in September nineteen ninety eight, and and like if. Either like Tony Jones or Mike Modis got a full time contract with the WWE, Roland would get 20% of their contracts. And the match was pretty good, but like the fans weren't buying it because both Mike and Tony were not regulars on WWE TV. So all oh, the boys said that, that Jones has potential and Mike Modis is ready. But they never heard back from the WWE. And then they showed. The first of the main, one of the main players in the movie, Terry Funk, and they were saying that Terry Funk was winding down his career. They showed him at the Double Cross Ranch in Amarillo, Texas, with his wife Vicky, and then later they showed him with his one of his daughters getting married, and it was pretty good. His good, and then he was talking about like him going to ECW to get. ECW up and running for the paid per view business, which happened on April 13th, 1997. And they showed the stuff, the backstage of Terry Funk getting ready, and also ECW's first pay per view with Paul Heyman on all, all the other wrestlers waiting for pay per view. And then they showed the match clips of the match that of the triple threat match between him and the Sandman and Stevie Richards, and then it was like they're saying to go home. The meaning the thing went too long, and then to get Raven in, and then they show clips, and then um, Terry Funk wins the ECW World Title, and then the next feature feature is about Mick Foley, and they were showing Mick Foley with his wife and kids, and stuff, and also shows the beatings that Mick Foley takes. And he also shows him with his father. And Barry said that he, Mick is, was the most down-to-earth character he's ever seen for, the, for professional wrestling. And it was pretty good. And then later on, the third p main subject of the movie, the main player was Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake the Snake Roberts called up Barry Bloom, Bloomstein about, about like him being in the, the movie. Jake the Snake was a big wrestling star in the 80s and 90s, but he fell into some hard times. He was basically kind of homeless, on drugs and alcohol, and he was saying that about his troubled childhood, that he, his mother, he was born, his mother was 13 years old, and his, and his father, who was Gri Grizzly Smith, a kind of a legendary wrestler in the South, who later became a kind of one of those WCW backstage um, employees who also came into the ring one of the suits to break up fights. He was dating Jake the Snake's grandmother at the time, so he kind of, you know, raped Jake the Snake's mother, who was only 13 at the time, so was dating his mother's mother, and they showed, like, Jake the Snake and with his father for the, the hour they were spent together, they barely looked at each other, and then Grizzly Smith said that I love love him, he was born out of love. And then they showed continued clips of like Mick Fall 
with Mick Foley calling Barry after he gets that dr- jumped on jumped on the head on Hell in the Cell, nineteen ninety eight, saying he was kind of incoherent and stuff. And then I think a, f- a few scenes later they show t- Terry Funk again, saying Terry Funk was getting ready for his retirement match. On September 11, 1997, against Bret the Hitman Hart. And then they showed a focus with a, a local wrestler who was in Al- Amarillo, Texas as well, called Dennis Stamp. Dennis Stamp wrestled over 600 matches, but he was not a main event wrestler. He was kind of a preliminary wrestler. And they showed Dennis Stamp, are you going to be at this event Thursday night? He says, no, I'm not bucked. He said he was mad saying that. He could have had a good match with Te- um, Dory Funk Jr., who was also on the card. And then they showed Terry Funk and Dennis talking, saying he was getting a little mad. Let, let me, hey, he was telling Dennis that let me referee Brett, you and Brett, you and Brett. And then Dennis Stamp kind of leaves. And I also saw him training, saying, I have to stay in shape because I'm 50 years old. And you never know what the next match the next match is going to be, and he says he wasn't in, he didn't have a match since 1991, and then he's, he was a exterminator. And then later on, and Dennis Stamps says, are you serious? He agrees to referee. That's good. And then they show Terry Funk also, like, um, losing to Bret the Hitman out in his retirement match. He, he, like, wanted to lose it because he didn't want to go out the winner. And then later on, they showed a scene with Jake the Snake Roberts again. He was in minor league wrestling territories in like cities in Nebraska and stuff. And dictator, he says he could be a dictator mayor in one of these cities. And then they have the reunited with his daughter Brandy, who in the movie. Jake has claimed he never saw in five years, and Brandy was very mad because Jake the Snake Roberts did not focus on family. He, was, he says he was in the camera all of his life and stuff like that, and he should break away from the camera and that. And then Jake the Snake was saying, I, why couldn't I take, he was talking about he couldn't take three months off from WWE because if he did, he'd be fired. And then they were low men and stuff, and then they showed Jake the Snake back in his room smoking cocaine and stuff or crack and then they show again with Mick Foley and stuff with that brutal match he had at Royal Rumble 1999 the I quit match with The Rock and then the pe- beatings he was taken from The Rock and The Rock and Mick Foley and stuff and it was this and they show I quit I quit he didn't even say I quit it was stuff and then at the and they showed Mick's kids crying and getting all scared and stuff like that. And then so after the match, they show Mick Foley going in the back, back and and like getting stitched up and stuff like that and being scary. And his wife says, I don't know how much I could take this anymore. And then they showed The Rock and stuff like that, that shaking hands, good match and stuff and that. And then at the end of the at the end of the movie, Barry says that Mike Modest and Tony Jones never heard from the WWE. And they also said that T- Terry Funk was retirement only lasted six months. And then he says he retired again in 1999. And he says, not, he's into the next offer comes. They also showed Nick Foley still going strong. And they said the ECW got a television contract with the TNN, which now is Spike TV, and then they said the WWE got on the stock market, and then they says three days after this was taping, Darren Drozdoff got paralyzed in a match with D'Lo Brown, hoping that he could walk again. This was one of the greatest documentary movies of all time. I saw it in the movie theaters at in March of 2000 at the old Nickelodeon Boston. It was a pretty good movie. One of the best documentary movies I've ever seen. I listened to some like podcast, a place to be podcast, and they kind of kind of have a little joking with Dennis Stamp joking with, about that because he says I'm not buck. I don't do tricks and stuff like that because of that. But you know, overall, I think 
Beyond the Mat, one of the greatest documentary movies of all time. It was also the movie that Vince McMahon did not want you to see. And it was a great movie. I have it on DVD. It's on, on like, on demand. I think people should catch it because it's a good movie. I give it two thumbs up, okay? I'll be back later, Facebook friends and YouTube followers, for more. And my third and final video blog of the night is about Danny Ainge. Have a good day, Facebook friends and YouTube followers. Bye now.